Greetings, everybody. It's good to be back with you again for the second session of our, our portion of this conference. Before I start, I want uh, to invite somebody to give you greetings. Rashma. Hello, everyone. I know you cannot see us, but we feel you in the spirit. I just wanted to stop by and say um, hello to all our family in Philippines and share my love, how much we miss you. And we have missed you coming there in person, but praying that God will uh, make a way that we can come in person and be with you so we can hug on you and love on you and share Christ's uh, love with you. And also, I just wanted to say during this season, as we celebrate his resurrection together and Passover, I pray the power of the Holy Spirit will come into that arena and touch your hearts in a special way like never before, and you will be refreshed once more with power of the Holy Spirit and the power of His blood. Love you all and enjoy your time, and God bless you. We'll see you soon. Love you all. Thank you. Amen. Praise God. God is good. I want to continue on a little bit more. I've got uh, a lot of notes here. I don't know that I'll cover them all, but I, what I have done this time that I've not done other times is these notes, I'm going to send them with the video so that uh, Bishop Daniel and whoever else will have access to them. And I know oftentimes, Bishop, you, you and everybody else, you like to put uh, uh, PowerPoints up. Whatever you want to do with the notes, they, they belong to you after I send them to you. But uh, it's been great fun. This study for me has been refreshing, revitalizing in me and, and teaching me uh, even more than I, I knew regarding the per plans, purposes of the Holy Spirit within the body of Christ and the world. So let's continue on. I, I believe I finished yesterday talking about the Holy Spirit's power and how it strengthens the church. According to he Ephesians 3.16, it says, in that great apostolic prayer, Paul praying, he said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. It's Holy Spirit within us operating by the auspices of the, the authority of God that strengthens us and prepares us and positions us that we can accomplish everything he said. So often in my life, I've had to fall back on the revelation that I can of my own self do nothing. Je Jesus said the same thing in John 5, 19. Jesus even said to his disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. So, you know, we fight against that in our, in our fleshly carnal minds because we're always encouraged to strive, to, to do everything we can to succeed. There is a striving that is separate from from trying to accomplish things in our own our own strength. The striving that I'm talking about here is it's strive to enter into rest. That means contend with your fleshly desires and your fleshly life. Contend with the enemy of your soul that you can enter into God's rest. That's the striving that particular scripture talks about. But we have to understand when it comes to the power of the Spirit of God and the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God and the unction of the Spirit, all, all, all those things equated to being led of the Spirit, there's nothing in our flesh that's going to accomplish the purposes of the plans of God. And so it is contingent upon us to realize this and to yield to the presence of the Holy Spirit that He can increase in us according to the will of God. One of the works of the Holy Spirit also is sanctification. This is something that's not often taught anymore in the church, nor is holiness, but it is the work of the Holy Spirit to enable believers to lead holy lives dedicated, set apart to the service of God, and to be conformed to His likeness or His image. In Matthew 3.11, it says, I indeed baptize you with water to repentance, speaking of John the Baptist. But he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, fire implies 
the Holy Spirit's work of purification and judgment. So he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, he, the enduo, the enduring uh, power and presence of God, but he also releases fire that we have an encounter with the, the portion of God that is a consuming fire. Well, God is a consuming fire to purify us. Now, it's interesting in the Old Covenant, it says that silver is tried in the furnace, but gold is purified seven times in a fire seven times hotter. For us to come forth as pure vessels unto God, and gold speaks of glory, by the way, if we want to walk in the glory, there's a process we engage whereby we allow the Spirit of God, that unquenchable fire, to take us to a sanctification process, a purifying process that enables us to walk in the glory. Many years ago, when I was just a young Christian, going to our first uh, first local church, it was a uh, wonderful pastor, Pastor L. Hammond, who was a, I'm not going to say he was a Pentecostal, he was a charismatic, but we, we believed in the gifts of the Spirit and the, the unction of the Spirit. One day, you know, in, in his ministration of the Spirit and the gifts, he, he had a prophetic word for me. The only part of that word I could ever remember was this part. The Lord says that you were going to become a pillar in the temple of God. I remember that because I pondered it so much, not having any concept of what that could mean. What's a pillar in the temple of God all about? I don't know. But over the years, as I meditated and searched the word, and, and, and the Lord took me through a process, I began to get a revelation and here's part of what he took me through. I was never an individual that had these wonderful experiences that so many people talk about and what most people gravitate towards. I'd heard testimonies of people being filled with the Spirit, and as that, that infilling occurred, they would go into a trance or a vision or have some type of supernatural manifestation come upon them that really marked their life. We had oftentimes gone to different meetings where men and women of God that were powerfully anointed of God would, would be used of God with signs, wonders, and miracles. And when they'd come to pray for me, I never felt a thing. And I started to feel like there's something really wrong with me. I never feel a thing. I, I don't have these experiences. I don't understand, Lord. One day, as I was pondering this, about 20 years on now, and, and asking God, why, why is it that I'm just, I, I'm almost like I'm spiritually dead. Everything I have to do, Lord, is by faith, because I certainly don't have encounters or, or any of these things. And that's when he spoke to me and he said, I've done this for a reason. I'm not giving you a tangible expression of what I'm working out in you, because had I done so, the way your character has been developed to this point, you would have wanted to stay in that arena of that experience, and you never would have progressed on by faith. So he kept me from an experience in order to do a work in my inner man of learning how to walk by faith to trust him. And so even though there was great anointing, even times of, of glory being manifested, I stood there almost as if there was nothing happening because I never sensed or felt it. I could see it. I could Let me explain. I could sense it, but I, I could see, but it, it, it almost didn't seem to affect me. And so he was developing within me an ability to walk by faith, not by sight, not by what I felt like, what I saw others doing, but to trust God. But then one time when we were in a meeting that was so powerful, with the, the presence of God and the glory of God, and everybody was dropping like flies. It was, it was the most powerful expression of his presence I'd ever seen. And I'm standing there, and I start feeling a little bit, but I said, Lord, what's going on? Why? Again, why am I the only one left standing? He once more said, I have been training you to walk by faith, but there's a deeper purpose. And he reminded me of that first prophetic word Pastor Al had given me when I was 17 years old. You will be a pillar in the temple of God. Now, what does a pillar do? It supports, it holds up or upholds that which has been uh, uh, built. 
He said, for you to stand in my very presence, in my temple, where my throne is, you have to learn to be able to stand in the manifest presence of your God and under the, glo the weight of my glory. That's what a pillar does. And so over all of these years, I have been training you not just to walk by faith, but to be able to stand under this powerful kabod, this weighty glory of the Spirit of God. And so I have instructed the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you at all times through this process so that you would be able in the hour that is coming to stand when my presence is manifested. Now that doesn't mean that I don't bow down in reverence and worship. That's not what I'm saying. But we all know even, even uh, Solomon in all of his wisdom, when he, when he inaugurated that temple, that first temple that he built, none of the priests, when they offered up offerings to God, nobody could stand because the glory of God came. Well, that, that was a picture of the very presence of the Spirit of God coming upon Jesus, who is the Word of God. But I'm telling you, we're in an hour now where Holy Spirit is about to be manifested and poured out. And we have to be not only submitted to Him and sensitive to Him, but enabled to stand in, in that that glory and that presencing of God so that we can effectively do what God tells us to do at those moments. So it is the Holy Spirit who baptizes you, not just with his presence, but with or Jesus sends his spirit to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, that purifying fire. All, if you reflect back, everything you've gone through, the most difficult seasons of your life, that have tempered and shaped your character. That was the fire of God. At the mo time, we, most of us don't understand it. We're just under this, this attack, this burden, this, this difficulty, and we're fighting and crying and contending and whining and complaining. Don't look at me like that's not you. I know that's you just as well it was me. But we, we go through this process in this fire so that God can do a work in us. That's the fire of purging and cleansing. Sanctification is a special work of the Holy Spirit. It is something that he has chosen to do in us and do through us. Now you can find this in Romans 15, 16, also in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, Galatians 5, 5, and 1 Peter 1, 2. It is the Holy Spirit whose special work is to sanctify us, to set us apart unto God so that we can be conform to the image of God, and become sons and daughters of the living God, walking in maturity at the end of the age. Not only that, not only is he the one that helps us to endeavor to walk into through that process, he requires believers to be sanctified. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, basically, that sanctification is a necessary part of being a Christian. It's necessary. And we talk about working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. That's what the Word of God teaches us. But our salvation isn't for our spirit, man. Do you know that? When you're born again, that spirit that was dead to the life of God becomes alive once again to the very Zoe, the God kind of life, and it lights up the in, inner man. It comes back to that place of uh, uh, first being established in Adam and Eve when they walked and talked with God face to face in the cool of the garden. But what it is, is that process of salvation is something that is ongoing in our life, and it has to do with our soul, our mind, will, emotions. It is the process of renewing our mind, of working out our salvation by casting down imaginations and taking every thought captive and investing the Word into us, meditating on the Word, letting it conform us, that's working out our salvation. Anything other than that, the, the works that we do for the kingdom are not necessarily the process of working out our salvation. So we have made works of service to be understood as working out our salvation, and that's not the way it's intended. Working out your salvation is to have your mind, will, and emotions conformed to the very character of Christ. And that is the struggle every human being that is born again goes through. On the same note, and in the, on the other hand, the enemy is trying to 
conform the world, those unsaved or uh, those unredeemed, into his likeness and his character of evil, wickedness, lying, cheating, corruption, perversion, all of those things. And the Spirit of God tells us, don't think on those things, think on the heavenly things. Don't look on the things under the earth, look on the things above. Why? Because the Word of God, the God of the Word, knows the strategies of the enemy and knows the weaknesses of human flesh, so he gives us the Holy Spirit to help us walk out the process of being conformed to Christ. Walk out this process of sanctification daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes moment by moment. And so we must yield to this process. It's so you'll also find corroborating scriptures in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 and 19. Now the Holy Spirit in enables the believers to be sanctified. Remember, it's not my strength, it's not my commitment, it's not my determination. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the yieldness, yieldedness to Him that allows this process to be engaged. And so we have to accept the fact that we are weak, and when we're weak, He becomes our strength. When we are weak, He becomes our strength. I'm so grateful to God for that. You can find those scriptures in Romans 8.4 and also Romans 8.13 and Ephesians 5.18. He works out these things within us. Thank God for that. Not only does he do this special work for us, not only does he require us to be sanctified, not only does he enable us to be sanctified, but it's the Holy Spirit that produces sanctification. You can find that in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, Romans 14, 17, and 2 Timothy 1, 7. It is the Holy Spirit that does this. Now, the process of sanctification, and I'm spending a little more time on sanctification because it, it is a, a subject area that has been lacking in most believers because, again, we are attracted more to the spectacular, to supernatural events and occurrences, and we all love to see God move in power and might. We all have been crying out for the Holy Spirit to move in power. We've been praying for a great awakening and revival, and you know, that's already here if we just move forward with it. God's already given us those things we need to walk forward into this, and he's already positioned us for this great move. We just have to say, thank you, Lord, I'm walking forward with this. But sanctification is a process. The Holy Spirit's, Spirit makes believers more like Jesus Christ in 2 Corinthians 3.18. He makes us more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit helps mortify or crucify or kill sinful human nature. Thank God for that. I know in my own life it was through seasons of brokenness coming to the end of myself and just being absolutely devastated and broken, that my human flesh, my human nature, that was contrary to the nature of God, was crucified. And it brought me into different seasons of relationship and revelation and, and freedom in Christ. So it's the Holy Spirit that helps us walk these processes out. Romans 8, 13, Galatians 5, 17. Another thing that helps us is the Holy Spirit is opposed to natural or fleshly or carnal desires, Galatians 5, 16 through 17. He says, by the deeds, the it says the Spirit is contrary to the flesh. They're always fighting one another. Why? Because the Spirit of God is trying to deliver you from the, the, the hooks that this this. This world has in you that the enemy has had in you all of your life, that the flesh has had in you, been driving you, having his free will in your life until the Holy Spirit came in and says, no, now we've got to do some house cleaning. We have to break off these snares. We have to unhook you from the, the, the things that so easily ensnare you and set you free to become. In Galatians, or also in Romans 8, 5 through 9, and Jude 19, we see this process of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are examples in the Old Covenant as well as the New of people who were sanctified by the Holy Spirit. One of them is Joshua. You'll find that in Numbers 27, 18 and Deuteronomy 34, 9. You have Simeon in Luke chapter 2, 25. You have the deacons in Jerusalem in Acts 3, 
6, 3, and 5. You have Barnabas in Acts eleven twenty four. You have Paul and his companions in 2 Corinthians 6, 6. So we know it is the Holy Spirit at work having the process worked out and reaching success in individuals that learn how to yield to him. Another aspect of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is both an expression of God's grace and the means by which it is experienced. What? God's grace. The Holy Spirit himself is a gracious gift of God. So many times in Scripture, I mean, we receive the grace of God. We receive the Holy Spirit of God, which is the grace of God. I'm going to carry that even farther, further. God has given us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might obtain. So it's the grace of God that proffers the gift, offers to unto you these gifts. But it's the Holy Spirit, that gracious gift of God that we've received that enables us to line up with these promises that God's given us and leads us into the light of that truth. So God not only calls you, he equips you by the Holy Spirit, and what we do is submit, and we enter into the fullness of the promise that God has given to us, a promise to us. So the graciousness of the gift of God, Acts 2, 38, 6, 5 through 8, 1 John 3, 24, there's also many other scriptures, I won't go over them all, but God has called us and given himself a gracious gift, his Holy Spirit. Through this Holy Spirit, God brings believers out of slavery into his family. Romans 8, 15 through 16 says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, by which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So it's the Holy Spirit who, spirit who brings us out of the bondage of slavery to the sin of this world into the adoption of the children of God. You can also read Galatians 4, 6, and 7 and Ephesians 2, 17 and 18. Through the auspices of the Holy Spirit in us, God equips believers to serve him. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 12, 4 through 7 says, but there are differences of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are differences of workings, but it is the same God working all things in all. But to each one is given the showing forth of the Spirit to our prophet. Now the differing of the gifts, it is the Holy Spirit that gives gifts unto men. When he talks about ministries, and it's the same Lord that it distributes ministries, you've got to understand, gifting comes from the Spirit. Ministry, it comes from the, it's an office that God releases, and it's under the authority of, of the Father. So we have one is a gift freely given, and the gifts are without repentance. Another one is a calling, it's out repentance. But it's the Holy Spirit who flows through us in the gifts, and it's submission to the authority of the Father in heaven, in ministry, whatever ministry we're called to. So we see a functioning together in an aspect that is not necessary to really have to uh, quantify, but I want you to understand it's the Spirit of God, the Father, and the Son all work together. They all work together. You can also read John 7, 37 through 39, Acts 1, 8, Acts 2, 4, Acts 4, 30, run. 31, Romans 5, 5, Galatians 3, 5, and Hebrews 2, 4. The Holy, the Holy Scripture, the, the Bible is just full of, full of Scriptures that confirm what he's trying to communicate. It takes a little effort. It takes time. But as we dig through the Word, we discover some powerful truths that if we're honest with each other, we, we genuinely need greater revelation right now than we ever have before. We're at the end of the age. We are at the end of the age. Now, the Holy Spirit obviously is in the process of God's work of redemption. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free of the law of sin and death. So what is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? Well, we've been bought with, with a price, the price of Jesus, the, the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, to equip us, to position us now to progress and to grow up into him in all things. You'll find also in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5, and also 13, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 through 5, and 1 Peter 1, 12. He, he, he speaks more on this. Now, we're, most of us are, are familiar with the aspect of the Holy Spirit filling us. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be energized and controlled by the third person of the Godhead in such a way that under the acknowledged lordship of Jesus Christ, the full presence and power of God are experienced. Spirit filling leads to renewal, obedience, boldness, and testimony, and arresting quality in believers' lives, an arresting quality that keeps you back from those things that are, are grieving to him. It is the Holy Spirit that we are to be energized by and controlled by. Now, a lot of people don't like that. No, I don't like to be controlled by anybody. I'm a free moral agent. No, you're not. Never have been, never will be. How can I say that? Because when you were in the world, what you considered freedom was actually bondage to the, 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 the ruler of this world. He was subtle about it. Most people never recognize or realize they're serving the father of lies. But to think that you have free moral agent, you have it in this respect when you, ha you can choose right or wrong. But most of us, because we're blinded to, to what God says about right or wrong, we choose wrong a, a lot of the time. However, when we come into the kingdom, we have more access to, to choice. When you're blind, you accept whatever's there. When your eyes are open, you have a greater choice. You can choose right or wrong, good or bad, darkness or light. And God begins to work in us and sensitize us and lead us and through the sanctification process by the Spirit of God that we have greater clarity in our ability to discern and make proper choices. Now, there were people filled with the Holy Spirit before the ministry of Jesus Christ on the earth in, when he came in the first century church, you know, the Gospels. In his, Exodus 31, 3, it says, Bezalel was filled with the Spirit for artwork on the tabernacle. Again, the word for Spirit, Eruach, the Spirit of God. In Deuteronomy 34, 9, it says, Joshua was filled with the Spirit to succeed Moses. Moses, again, Ruach, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. We call it Holy Spirit in the New Covenant. They just said Spirit in the Old Covenant. Then we come to the renewed covenant. It says in the event, and that's just a couple of them. In the events surrounding the birth of Jesus, or birth of Jesus and the birth of John the Baptist, it says in Luke 1:15, John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit, even in his mother's womb from birth. In Luke 1:41, Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit and spoke words of praise. In Luke 1:67, Zechariah prophesies about the life of John and God's salvation. All of these. All of these three instances, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They were baptized in the Spirit, it actually says. Now, that's, that's fascinating. Filled with the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with the Spirit. Even under a lesser covenant, because they were still operating in, in the Gospels under the Old Covenant. Even Jesus was walking under the Old Covenant and fulfilling every jot and tittle of the Old Covenant to release to us the renewed covenant and what we're privileged to be able to walk in in this hour. And Luke 4, 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So even Jesus had to be filled with the Spirit in his earthly ministry. How much more... Do we need to be filled with the Spirit? You can also read in Luke 10, 21, John 3, 34, and Acts 10, 38. Now, there's different uh, terminologies used in conjunction with the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. 
And Acts 1, 5, it says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And in Acts 2, 4, it says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Acts 10, 47, it says, Can anyone forbid water that these who have received the Holy Ghost, as well as we, should not be baptized? So there's a different iteration. Now, while these terms are virtually synonymous when used of the initial experiences of the Spirit, filled is also used to designate subsequent experiences and renewings of the same divine power, while their other terms are not. Do you know that you have the right, as children to God, not only to be filled, but to continually be filled, or continually have fillings, renewed fillings of the Holy Spirit? John in, pardon me, Peter, in the book of Acts, after they were taken before the Pharisees for speaking in the name of Jesus, they went apart aside and prayed. And they asked the Lord to give them greater boldness so that they might preach with greater boldness. And it says the place was shaken and they were filled again with the Holy Spirit. There are times we need to be filled again. And here's one of the insights the Lord has given me in this hour. We're going to have seasons, and they are upon us, just like Peter and the disciples, where they prayed for greater boldness in the face of greater opposition, and the Holy Spirit came upon them in greater power. We are in that season of maturation, as I have been saying. We've gone through a season of being hidden away, being quelled and quenched, no longer allowed to gather together, not permitted to praise or speak in churches because, you know, quote unquote, there was a problem with that. You're going to pass germs. But the Lord was doing a work in us as we sought his face. And we've asked for greater boldness. We're crying out for a greater power and a greater move of the Holy Ghost than ever before. And the Lord has heard that in one respect. Now, hear, hear my heart. In one respect, even though what was meant for evil by, by the machinations of men and all of these things going on to lockdowns, and now what's about to come is great uh, famine because food shortages are beginning to happen all over the earth. But God has pushed his people into this place of desperation and crying out. And it's in that place of desperation and crying out, Holy Spirit, come in power. Holy Spirit, fill us with greater boldness. Holy Spirit, lead and guide us in all things. That God is now releasing what has been withholding those blessings. And we're going to balk in them. We are at a fullness of time seasons. Part of the blockage of any move of God is timing. Not that his heart isn't for his people and his heart isn't for redemption for others. But there's a timing. There's a kairos moment for everything under the sun. And so here we have come into this last day season, this last moment, if you will, that the Lord is beginning to pour out as never before. I, I, I don't know if, and I don't recall if I shared with this, this with you before, but um, last Rosh Hashanah on the Feast of Trumpets, I had an encounter with God that was uh, different than anyone I've ever had before. Uh, if, if you've been familiar with things going on in the world, I, I don't know if you've ever seen it there, but they have what they call the, um, the, the, the atomic clock, not the atomic clock, the, the, um, the clock that they count down to midnight, which means the destruction of all things. And, and I've seen that over the years as they bring it up. Now, first we were, I remember the first time I saw it, we were seven minutes to midnight before doomsday. And then I remember clearly seeing now we're five minutes and then three. And the last one I saw was, was maybe one and a half to two minutes. But on Rosh Hashanah, I watched as that final hand clicked into midnight, the end. And I heard the reverberations, the throughout wherever I was standing with God is this echo of that final click into place and the clock stopped. And 
And I knew immediately what God was saying, and he spoke because I knew what he was saying just in that pictographic experience. He said, it's finished. Time is at an end. The, uh, the season of grace for, my, for the church is, is, is over. He said, in this last reverberations of that final click is the season of the great awakening. And remember, I can do more in a moment than any human being's done in 6,000 years of life. So those reverberations are still echo. I still hear the echo in my spirit. And they haven't grown much fainter, but I hear it slightly less. But I know we're in the final moments where this great awakening is about to explode. And so that put an urgency in my heart to begin to do everything I could to, to, to reach out and, and, and teach and preach the good news because the end of all things is at hand. We're coming to the end very quickly, but God has positioned you and I through circumstance, through design attributes he's deposited within us. I, I'm, I'm still convinced and I can prove by the word, I won't go there today, that your desire to know God, your, your desperation and passion for a great awakening is something he birthed in you because that's the seed he deposited and he's been watching it grow in you as the cry of desperation has grown. And we have watched many that we have loved become seed in the earth as they've, they've died in this process of maturation and coming into the fullness of what God wants. But God says those seeds of those who have gone on have not been wasted. Lives have not been wasted of his saints. They have gone a seed into the earth to bring forth all that they spoke about, all that they prophesied, all that they were looking towards was that seed that was within them that now is breaking forth. We're the recipients of that. We should be grateful. Yes, separation is difficult, but it's a temporary separation. But now we're moving into the season that really every one of us from Adam on has been looking towards this redemption of all mankind, this final act of God in the earth. To be filled with the Spirit is an apostolic command. In Ephesians 5.18, the present tense of the verb implies that the need to be filled, regularly filled and refilled with the Spirit is our portion. We must be filled be he filled with the Spirit, or regularly filled, or continuously refilled with the Spirit of God. Filled with the Spirit, a conscious experience of God's power. Acts 2 forces, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. I've seen that in action. I've, I've been in a place where I was speaking in a tongue, and it was Slavic. I didn't know what it was, but a friend of mine who was there spoke that language and interpreted. I've spoken in the tongues of angels and had encounters with angels and spoke with them in their own language, the, the, the different groups of angels. that was, And I understood it perfectly, but I heard something I'd never spoken in tongues before, and God invested within me this ability to speak in that particular angelic tongue. But there's another language that God's releasing and another revelation about this ability to speak by the Holy Spirit is a creative language. It's the language of the Father. It's the language of the Son. It's a language of the Spirit that brings forth creative light and life, unlike anything we've seen before. We have known in part, we've prophesied in part, but when that which is perfect is come, love, then those things will be done away. Well, what's perfect about love is that it's the very presence of God because God is love. At this hour in this generation, the God of love is manifesting himself in us and to us, and he's presencing himself together with us, and the Holy Spirit is now releasing a different tongue, a different language, where we're, we begin to speak forth with a great boldness, with great clarity, and we see the kingdom of heaven released on the earth in ways we have never experienced before. Can we agree together that we'll yield to this process? God wants a forerunner company of believers, those who have seen what's to come. Intercessors, you have been so positioned by God for this very hour 
by your sensitivity to the Spirit, by your willingness to be obedient to the clarion call of the Spirit. Get up in the middle of the night, pray. You heard the voice of the prophet, pray. You're you're positioned for this. You have been tempered for this. God is calling you to this. And now he's releasing you to this. Being full of the Spirit is a consistent quality of Christ-like or Christian character. In Acts 6, 3 through 5, it says, Therefore, brothers, look out among you from among you seven men, being witness to being full of the Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this duty, full of the Spirit and wisdom. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And the saying pleases all the multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procreus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So here we see that to be seven men being witness to being full, being filled and continually filled, repeatedly filled of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. I love that, because that word full applies to wisdom also. To be filled with wisdom, to be continually being filled with wisdom, to be filled consistently all the time with the wisdom of God to meet every situation, to confront every need, every every circumstance that comes your way. Filled with the Spirit means the inspiration to speak words of witness, challenge, or rebuke. Now, you have to be careful there. There is a proper method according to the Word of God in bringing rebuke. One-on-one with another witness in front of all. Who brings that level of rebuke? Fivefold ministry. It's not somebody who comes against a pastor or an apostle or a prophet. Or man. Although if they have an issue, they go to that one. If it's unresolved, they take another one and go to that one. There is a process. We fail to utilize that process because what happens is we take an offense, we, we get together and we complain and gossip and slander and backbite, and then we cause division as in splits. It's happened in some of your churches, even over this time of this COVID crisis. That shows the shallowness of the relationship and understanding of the word in those that participated in such a thing. At best, It was a spiritual blindness. But quite often and quite frankly, it's usually because the individuals that perpetrate such a thing are immature and blinded to what Scripture teaches and what the Spirit has said and how we comport ourselves in such an issue. God hates rebellion and nothing that started in rebellion is going to have a blessing of God on it. Nothing. It will fail. We have to be people that are filled and continually filled and refilled and overflowing in that filling. In Acts 4, 8, Peter is testifying before the Sanhedrin. And then he was filled. In Acts 7, 55, Stephen testifying to the Sanhedrin, seeing the glory of God. Something shifted. In Acts 13, 9, Paul rebukes Yelimaeus. All these are examples of of being filled with the Spirit and the inspiration to speak words of witness, challenge, or rebuke. Witness, challenge, or rebuke. Now, there are characteristics that come with a Spirit-filled life. We've known, and I've said it already, that the Spirit should rule or control the believer's life. Romans 8, 4 through 6, it says, so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For they who are according to the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but they who are according to the Spirit mind the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded, to be constantly thinking on the things of this world, the circumstances, the, 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 the happenings around the earth, If that's where our focus is, that brings death. But to be spiritually minded, thinking on things above, meditating on the word, spiritually minded, it's life and peace. 
You can also read in Galatians 5, 16, verse 25. The Spirit produces the fruit of Christ-like character, Romans 15, 13, 2 Corinthians 6, 6, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. The Spirit brings liberty, Romans 7, 6. But now we, having been set free from the law, having died to that which we were held, so that we serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So we have been brought to liberty, newness of life. We're new creations. Do a study on that new creation. That means literally, and I'm going to paraphrase, something that has never been before it's a brand we were a new species that came forth that has never been witnessed before we had a type and shadow in adam and eve we definitely had had that in christ but when jesus said it's finished and we accepted the the, the blood that he he shed for us and and accepted that work we became a new species of creation so the creation didn't end in the garden of eden there was a new creation when we accepted Christ, a new species of man, a new species of woman. And we have so many great and precious promises that belong only to this new species, this new creature that we have not yet even begun to explore. My heart and my prayer for all of you, as well as myself, is that we begin to receive revelation of all that it is that God gave to us. Yes, we've read many of the promises in Scripture. We've understood maybe a few. But I know that we're coming to this hour when the, the revelation of God will so overwhelm us with the significance of what He has purchased for us and released to this new species of creation that we're going to look back and think, how in the world did I even make it this far with the lack of knowledge and understanding I had other than the grace and mercy of God? We're in a time of great revelation, a time of great outpouring, a time of transformation into the very likeness of the one we love. It's the time of the parousia and phanerio. Parousia as he presences himself together with us, and then phanerio as we see him as he is, we're going to be like him. That's before the catching away. We're in that season. And it's going to accelerate even more. Being filled with the Spirit obviously often leads to words of praise. When that Spirit of God begins to bubble up through you, in Acts 2, 4, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance, and they began to worship and praise God. Acts 4, 31, also in Acts 10, 44 through 46, Acts 19, 6, Ephesians 5, 18 through 20. There are characteristics linked with the fullness of the Spirit. Now, this is interesting. The fullness of the Spirit. We have skill in Exodus 31, 3 and 35, 31. We have wisdom, Deuteronomy 34, 9 and Acts 6, 3. We have joy in Luke 10, 21 and Acts 13, 52. We have faith, Acts 6, 5 and 11, 24. Hmm. Now, there's fruit that accompanies the filling of the Holy Spirit. The living presence of the Holy Spirit in believers leads to Christ-like virtues within them. Just as a living tree will bear good fruit. So we must yield to the process. God expects his people to bear spiritual fruit. In Isaiah 5.4, it says, What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Who knows? I looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded rotten grapes. Fruit is a term used to indicate the produce or outcome of a person's life. God expects fruit from our life. Fruit that has been uh, released in us and through us by the Holy Spirit. Good works, works of faith. Christ-like character. There's got to be fruit. There must be evidence. 
you know, we, we, we've talked on this many times. It's been one of my, um, I'm not going to say pet peeves, but one of, one of the things I see in Christians today, they're so attracted to supernatural happenings that they, and oftentimes they lack discernment. And even in the Christian circles, many can be uh, used of God mightily. How do I mean that? Because God gives gifts. And you can exercise gifts to the, to the, almost to the perfection of that gift. And yet, if you don't have Christ-like character, there's not going to be much fruit. See, gifting will carry you where fruit, where, where, yeah, gifting can carry you where character will not sustain you. The fruit is not so much in what you've done, it's in who you've become. Now, there are fruits of righteousness, righteous works. But remember, many will come to Jesus in that day saying, didn't we prophesy in your name with Christ-like character? Didn't we cast out demons and do all these things? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. So the fruit of the Spirit has got to be a little bit different. Think on that. Many who have had powerful ministries in the past died in, in, in abject spiritual poverty, apostate, fallen away. Why? Because the foundation of character wasn't there. So the fruit of, of their ministry... And why is this so dangerous? Because little leaven leavens the whole. We can talk about modern day examples. Those that have been elevated too far too quickly. And, it, it, you know, and I'm not going to mention names, but there was a young man that was elevated and recognized by some of the spiritual generals. I don't know where we get generals when Jesus is the captain of our salvation, but I'll leave that for somebody else to, to ponder. But we get these people that are pushed forward and recognized as apostolic leaders they've got the next great mantle of god and the next day they fall in uh, or they're exposed in the sin that they have been walking in adultery and and drug abuse and, and all sorts of and pandering after money and merchandising their anointing and it all became about money and then we see the ones that they mentored who have the same mindset and they think and, and we've been in meetings where these these disciples of these individuals have come, and we've heard the comments. Boy, this, this is great. I'm going to come out of this place with over $200,000. You watch. Well, that was their mindset because that's what they've been taught. That little leaven entered into them, and it became the driving force of their life. Not, not submission to God, not the character of Christ. Fruit is important because what you bear in your life, what you release from your life, it does bear fruit, but I'm talking about fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit leads to believers over becoming Christ-like. I've, I've talked about that. In Galatians 5.16, Christ-like qualities are contrasted with sinful qualities. We have the fruit of Spirit-filled living in Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. There's other evidences of the Holy Spirit's activity in our lives. Romans 14, 17 talks about righteousness. Romans 15, 13 and Galatians 5, 5 speaks of hope. Ephesians 1, 17 speaks of wisdom. Ephesians 5, 18 speaks of temperance. So evidences of the Spirit's activity in our life are, again, the, perf the, 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 the perfecting, perfecting of our, our character and our nature, the, the honing stone that sharpens us to become more and more like Christ. The evidence of the fruit of the Spirit is a result of divine activity, not of human effort. Galatians, or 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 16 and Galatians 2, 20. God is doing an amazing thing in the earth today. And we are grateful to God for doing these things. Let me give you some prophetic insight and significance. John 7, 37 through 39, it says, In the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of 